Welcome to the Let's Talk About Talking podcast with your host, Adrian Fuller, language and communications expert for kids of all ages. On this podcast, we talk about speech, language, and all things happening with your child, giving you specific tactical information you can use to help your kids talk, listen, and thrive in their academic journey. Hey everybody, this is Adrienne, also known as Miss AVSLP, and I want to just say welcome to the Let's Talk About Talking podcast. And remember, on this podcast, guys, we we talk about all things that have to do with your child's speech, language, and a- academic journey. And so today I brought on a friend of mine. Her name is Gail Hagerman, and she is an OT. And I always tell the story, Gail, that, you know, we at the clinic, at our clinic, we were speech therapy only for like seven or eight years. And then I really realized how many of our kids needed occupational therapy and just the magic that speech and OT can have. So I want to say thank you so much for being with me. Well, thank you for having me on. And um, I agree a thousand percent uh, OT and speech. We're frozen. Oh no. I'm back. <laughs> well, what happened? I have no idea. You just disappeared. Um you froze and now there are two of you. So I'll get rid oh. of you. I'll get rid of you and thanks. Okay. 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 All right. I was like, oh, this was so good. And now we have to start all over. Sorry. That's I don't fine. Really okay. That's fine. Okay, we're starting over. Okay. Welcome, you guys. This is Adrian Fuller, speech language pathologist, also known as Miss ADSLP. I want to just say welcome to the to the Let's Talk About Talking podcast. And remember, on this podcast, we talk about all things speech, language, and academic uh, that affect your child throughout their academic journey. And today, I have asked one of my friends, Gail Hagerman, occupational therapist, to join us today. Gail and I were, were just chatting, and she says she has been an OT for 32 years. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Gail, as you know, I have a clinic in the Central Florida area, and we were speech only for a very long time. And then maybe two or three years ago, we really began to just, in all honesty, lose patients because they were going somewhere else for occupational therapy. But then also we realized just how beneficial OT and speech can be. It's like the best marriage ever. And so welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thanks for having me on. So um, t- I love talking about OT. So <laughs> I'll talk about it anytime. Yes. And I'm with you. A hundred percent. Um, OT and speech is a great combination. We work together so nicely. We really, really do. Um, go ahead and it's so funny. I was doing a screen today and I was doing, you know, what professionals do, like sh- shooting out a lot of acronyms. I was like, yes, I'm the SLP and I'm, I think this kid needs OT. And the parent was like, what's OT? I felt so yeah. small because I really, I really want to make any communication I have with parents, very listener friendly. So for anyone just listening out there, can you tell them in a kind of succinct way, but tell us what OT is, occupational therapy is. Sure. I know it's very easy for parents to get overwhelmed with this alphabet soup of acronyms. And I know it can be embarrassing to be, what is an IEP? What is an SLP? You know, um, But OT, occupational therapy, 
refers to helping a client, in this case a child, um, be able to do the occupations that make up their day. So for a child, the occupations are taking care of themselves, getting dressed, um, feeding themselves, getting to the bathroom, and all those little tasks that make up their everyday um, uh, their everyday life. The work of childhood is play. So we work very hard on um, play skills as well, because playing is how we learn. So if we can access the play, we can learn. Um, there's a lot of skills that we know about and probably several uh, several hundred more that we don't know about that kids learn from play every day. Um, social skills, physical skills, visual motor skills, language skills, um, uh, sensory processing skills, um, and then a lot that a lot of things that fall in between those that we we're not even all that aware of. So it's um, basically just enabling children to access their everyday tasks, especially play. Um, and then I work in the school system. The task, the occupation of a child in school is um, writing their work, maybe using a computer as they get a little older, um, being able to do the everyday tasks of walking in line, waiting their turn, handling the noise and the jostling that goes on in school. Um, so we work on a lot of tasks like that in the school as well. You know, you said something that really resonated with me and you said the job of the child is play. That's so true. I love that. I love all that. I know often um, we treat play as sort of a reward for doing their work or we see it as um something fun but not fundamental but really i mean even as adults i think we lose touch of like a lot of great scientific discoveries and things were made by people just kind of playing with their test tubes or their um yeah. microscopes or um you know just having that curiosity and discovering new ways of doing things very cool well i find that in our clinic our preschool and school aged kids, we probably work with handwriting and sensory issues the most. Yeah. Can you talk about handwriting and fine motor skills for just a second and how it might look yeah. if your child is having issues with it, with handwriting or fine motor skills? Um. Okay, so handwriting, we think of handwriting as sort of a starting point, like we get to pre-K and we're going to start writing. But really what goes into being able to write, there's so many things that need to be there before a child can even write. Um, if you think of like maybe a two, two and a half year old, they often, they can't even squeeze toothpaste out of the tube yet. Mm -hmm. And then by three and a half or four we're expecting them to sit for 30 minutes at a time with a crayon and color and mm -hmm. um that's a huge leap to make yes um so b before a child is even starting handwriting they need to understand um they need to have the grasp strength in their hands to manipulate small objects mm -hmm. um that's often a skill that kids miss these days because they grow up on um, iPads instead mm -hmm. of instead of coloring with crayons and you know there's 20 tiny little muscles inside your hand wow. and when you're born they're all they're not developed you can make a basic grasp but you can't do anything fiddly and then it's got to you know so much has to happen with those little muscles in a few short years so a prerequisite for handwriting is grasp strength. It's also um, uh, being able to understand the sensation um, to figure out how hard to hold the pencil, um, to be able to tolerate the sensation of the pencil or the crayon or chalk. Um, 
you know, they need a lot of visual perceptual skills, which is understanding bigger and smaller and inside and outside. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very hard to tell a child to write between the lines if they don't understand what between or inside or bigger or smaller means you if if you're trying to draw a face and you don't understand that the eyes are smaller so they have to you'll see a very small child will draw a face and the eyes are bigger than the whole head because they haven't learned bigger and smaller and top and bottom and all those concepts yet um yeah and then another um thing that we quite often overlook is postural control um if a child isn't sitting isn't able to sit upright and sit still and maintain that position at a table for 20 30 minutes at a time it would be like trying to write while you're walking on a tightrope um mm. if your body isn't sta- if your body can't stay still your hands certainly can't say stay still so there's a lot of before we even start writing there's so many um skills that have to be addressed so often when a child isn't writing, it's, there's just a myriad of things that, um, that skills that may be missing or, um, delayed with them. You know, that sounds a lot like speech therapy in some ways because we need a lot of things to happen before a child even talks. We need, you know, joint attention. We need, eye contact, just like you said, we need those things in place before a child starts writing, which I never, ever thought about. And like, even hearing you talk, I'm like, usually when I refer to OT, I'm pretty gentle about it. But now this conversation is going to make me a little bit more willing to press a little bit more, just because the things we do can overlap, but for the child to be successful, they do need these fine motor and postural things in place. So good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Often like handwriting is the first time it it sort of shows up or it's the first time a parent or an adult can really be aware of these skills lacking Mm -hmm. because you can see your child's, you know, writing up on the wall along with all his classmates Mm -hmm. and you can notice a difference. Um, Is there a way for a, maybe a parent of a toddler, like what's something that like a, I hate to say red flag, but I'm going to just, it's fine. What's a red flag for OT that maybe a toddler might, who is not yet writing their name might exhibit? Um, I would say delays in any self-care skills, if they're not um, holding a spoon and, you know, being able to use it, if they're not um, taking their clothes on and off. Um, it's very difficult for parents because often we've never parented a child before. Mm-hmm. So it's off, it's difficult to notice. And there is also, especially with toddlers, there's such a big range that is still normal. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of, I know my own daughter's pediatrician said to me, so much of pediatrics is wait and see. Um, you yeah. know, and the way it was explained to me, um, a teacher explained this to me. She said, some children like lose a tooth. They lose their first tooth when they're three years old. Others are six or seven. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean the child is smarter. It doesn't mean that they had a more caring or better parent. Exactly. It doesn't mean anything except that their physical body wasn't ready. So that it just um, a lot of variety is normal. Um, so I know it's, I would say, ask a professional. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a lot of standardized tests that we do where we compare all these little skills that develop to age norms. And if we, that uh, an official, like a formal occupational therapy evaluation can um, notice whether there's areas, like things that you might not even think are related, might show us an area that we need to work on. You know, I always say, especially for speech, I don't believe in necessarily in wait and see. Let's just see. 
but sometimes, many times, like you said, your pediatrician is going to push that just because of the myriad of kids they see. So I yeah. always tell parents, trust your gut. If your gut is telling you something is just not right, just like you said, we are the professionals. We have so many tests that we can use to say, hey, you know what? They're fine. They're okay for right now. Let's come back in six months instead of like, oh, let me just wait six months if yeah. there is a problem. Absolutely. And also, like, I've evaluated kids for occupational therapy and noticed, well, actually what they're needing is a, um, a language evaluation. They're not doing what the teacher says because they're not processing the instructions that the teacher is giving them. Mm -hmm. So it may look like, oh, they can't write or they can't do math or something. And it's, a, you know, a language. So, you know, we're, we're professionals, so we can pick up on those things. Yes, absolutely. And so, and just one other thing that you said that I love, sometimes I hear parents say things like, oh, this kid is spoiled. This kid is lazy. This kid is stubborn. But if they're lacking parents, the self-care skills, getting dressed, talking, things like that, and you feel that you need to help them along maybe more than you should, that could be an indication that you need to see a professional. Yes, th those adjectives, spoiled, lazy, stubborn, mm -hmm. uh, children are not, little children are not, not globally spoiled, lazy, or stubborn. Correct. And I agree with you, Adrian. I had my own child was taking a long time to start walking. And the doctor said to me, well, don't carry her everywhere. And you know, she's walking or crawling. She wasn't moving around at all. And I'm like, well, I'm not just going to leave her in the house. Her. <laughs> right. Of course I'm carrying her everywhere. She's not crawling. <laughs> you know, that is so funny because I tell parents that, like, if your child can say it, if your child can point to it and you get it, sometimes man manipulating the environment, there's a fine line between enabling and assisting. And yes. as a parent, you have to figure out what you're doing. Yes, yes. And in many ways, a child's behavior is their communication, especially if they have limited verbal skills. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's talk about sensory. That's becoming mm -hmm. more and more uh, of a hot topic, especially with the whole ABA. It may or may not. I'm hearing a lot of people say, don't do ABA, go the OT route. Um, and so I even find in our clinic, we, we used to say, okay, let's just, they're not, they're in difficulty transitioning. Let's send them out for ABA. But now we're taking a closer look and saying, is this something our OT can address? and start to make better. Can you talk about what sensory issues might look like in a in a little one? Sure. So when the whole term sensory processing is difficult for a lot of parents to understand because it's it's not really a term we use every day. Um and you'll also hear the term sensory diet, mm -hmm. which is very mm -hmm. confusing for parents because when we think of a diet we think of yeah, I need to stop eating donuts. <laughs> And this has nothing to do with that. Um, it's it's just talking about the... So the term sensory processing refers to our five senses and how, uh, as a person, we are getting all this information with the things we see, the things we hear, the noises all around us, the physical sensations, the, the sensation of our clothes on our skin and being bumped and jostled around by our classmates, um, a lot, uh, the smells and, um, tastes and sensations as well. And as adults, we've learned to process these. Um, we've learned to deal with the humming in the background. We've learned to deal with the f sort of flashing fluorescent light or, um, cars driving by outside. Um, but, some children are wired so that it's very difficult for them to deal with all of these um, sensations. And some uh, some children are under-responsive. 
So there can be a fire alarm going off and they don't, they're not really phased. They'll keep doing what they're doing. Um, or, um, they, we often, these become what we call sensory seekers where they will put glue all over their hands and their mm-hmm. face and they just always have mud and water and food everywhere. They're not aware of having food on their face or something. So they're sort of under responsive. Mm -hmm. And then we also get the opposite where they're over responsive, where the feeling, and I'm sure adults, some adults can relate to this, like the feeling of the seam on their sock just drives them crazy Mm -hmm. or labels on their clothing. Um, And this can really disable a child in the classroom. Um, a big area also of sensory processing is movement and transitioning, which we don't really think of as coming from our five senses. Some kids need to move all the time. Um, I've really seen over the years, I've been in the school system for 15 years, and I've really noticed that teachers have become more and more aware of this. Mm -hmm. Um, so the child who needs to move a lot, they will let that child hand out all the papers to everybody and take this thing down to the office. Uh, and teachers do also build movement into the classroom, like go, you know, um, moving, come up to the board, write things on the board, go back to your desk, go back, sit on the carpet, um, break up into groups. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we've become more aware of our need to move um and then transitioning from one activity to another that's a huge area of difficulty for a lot of kids um you know especially if the new activity is not as much fun as the previous one (laughs) and let me just interrupt when she says parents transitioning we can mean from one class to specials or one class to PE or lunch, but it can also mean transitioning from the car into the doctor's office or the car oh, yes. to speech or even like transitioning from having dinner to getting ready to go to bed. Are there any tips that you might give for parents who are having difficulty with transitions? The, your best friend is a timer. Yes. Um, Shout it because, out. <laughs> timers. Because then, <laughs> because then you're not the bad guy. The timer is the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you've put the idea in their head. Pretty soon I'm going to have to go to bed or I'm going to have to clean up my toys. So you've already put the idea in your, their head. You've prepared them. Um, and then. Uh, the timer is the bad guy, not you. And Mm -hmm. you will be amazed. Just try it a few times. You will be amazed what a difference it makes. Um, YouTube has a bunch of timers that are are cool. Yeah. There's sort of fun pictures. And obviously a, a small child, if you say 10 minutes and they see the numbers ticking down, they don't know what that means yet. So a visual timer is great. Like, you know, where the, the snake is ca- getting up to the mouse that he's going to catch or mm-hmm. um, a lot of them seem to be involved bombs going off, which <laughs> you may or may concerning. not love. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the fuse is burning um, and then it goes right. pow. Um, and of, of course, being a YouTube video, you can set it for five minutes or Whenever. 25 minutes, but even for little kids, even, setting a timer for half a minute like you can keep playing till it goes ting 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 um even that is fantastically effective um and then what helps uh is if there's any visual way that you can show a child what's going to happen the schedule um it's amazing the difference that makes as well um even within a 30 minute session for a child that struggles to transition, um, they can, we'll have a list where they can cross things off or pull off little Velcro pictures. Um, Or what I do if I don't have any equipment with me is I'll just uh, fold a piece of paper in half 
mm-hmm. and sort of cut the front of the paper to make like four little flaps so that they can flap the flaps closed as we go. I mean, you, I've done it with a post-it note in a grocery oh, store. That's <laughs> awesome. You know, in a pinch, we'll even just put three squares on paper and draw yes. the picture, free draw the pictures ourselves. Uh, but the picture schedule is so important. Kids yes. want to know what, what they're doing. Kids want to know what's going to happen next. Yes. And some more so than others. Yeah, definitely yeah, as well. <laughs> now, if there was a parent who was considering or on the fence about visiting their local occupational therapist, but they're not quite sure, what would you say? Um, obviously, I'm passionate about occupational therapy. It's what I do all day, every day, and I see fantastic um, improvement. Um, if you are not sure, um, if you can just get an evaluation and look at the information from that, start with that. You know, that will give you a sense of whether there are deficits in the first place. There may not be. Um, and where the areas of deficit are, and she will come up with some goals, you know, with you. Um, and we really do focus in the private OT setting. We definitely focus on what the parents' concerns are because, um, that's, um, that's why you brought them in the first place. It's your concern. And, um, once we can get them, uh, once we can get your household running smoother, let me put it that way, Great. everything changes. Once we're sleeping better, everything changes. Um, once the points of frustration are addressed and, th- and that becomes easier, family life becomes easier. Oh. So really get an evaluation and just make your decisions from there. So good. I love all of this. I really, really appreciate you joining us. Parent, one last thing. Just because you get an evaluation, you can take your evaluation and sit on it. You can think about it. It doesn't mean you're signing up for therapy, but it does give you information. And that's what both of us want is for parents and caregivers to get as much information as they can so they can make decisions about their child. And being profession professionals, there's so many things that an occupational therapist may notice. I've noticed um, students that their eyes don't scan properly. That's not my mm-hmm. field of expertise, but they've taken the child to, um, you know, get that looked at. I've noticed mm-hmm. um physical issues that a doctor needs to look at. Um, You know, I've noticed students that are possibly having seizures that nobody's picked up on because they're subtle. The the signs are subtle. Um, Yeah. There are, there are a lot of things that um, may be causing the problem that, that, you know, the child might not actually be needing OT. They might be needing something else addressed first. There's many, sometimes the more eyes you have on your child, it just gives you another perspective for sure. Definitely. Yeah. It's parenting is not an easy job. It is not at all. And it never ends. And you are never quite certain if you're doing it right or not. Um, But, you know, there are uh, people with a lot of uh, experience and training Uh, that can help you out. Gail, I've enjoyed this conversation. You are really Mm. passionate about occupational therapy. And I feel like you brought so much information to our listeners. And I do want to just give you a big thank you for everyone listening. I know you hear her wonderful accent and she is from South Africa. And, um, I just want to say thank you. I'm just so happy that you were able to join me today. Where can oh, people, thanks for having, thanks for can, having me on, Adrian. Where can people, can people contact you if they have questions or do you do anything on the side? No, I don't <gasps> work in the school system. <laughs> I, I know. Was, I was like, oh, I'm going to give her some, I'm going to give her some. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. She's just one of those yeah. gems, guys. You got to be assigned to the school where she goes. But um, I do want to say thank you so much. No, thank you for having me on. I, I love um, I love talking about OT. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye then. You've been listening to the Let's Talk About Talking podcast with your host, Adrian Fuller, language and communications expert for kids of all ages. You can grab Adrian's book, 30 Days to Get Your Toddler Talking, on Amazon or at speechbuilders.org.